And Boker Tov, it's a good thing, always good to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome everybody to part three of Dr. Kohler's fascinating series of, from Tor in Motion on Megillat Esther, uh, how readers like to read it, the different readings of Megillat Esther. And I think that's enough of an introduction, Dr. Kohler, otherwise you'll get upset at me. So, Vakasha. Thank you. And uh, yeah, good to see you. I think it's, it's, it's fair to say good morning to people even if we're not all that worried about concentration camps in the near future, right? Like it's just, it's nice, it's nice. Okay, um, I think, I, I didn't check actually, really tell me, you could tell me, I think posted on the website are, are some further sources for today. I'm, I'm gonna take a look, I didn't see them, I will check now, normally they're there, hopefully, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share them in the chat right now uh, in case they're not, and that way we can, uh, I think I'm gonna share them in the chat right now. Uh, let's see. Sorry. As an attachment, I think we should be able to do this. Yeah. So let me know. I think that should. I, think yeah, that should I don't have them remember. actually, because normally you would send me. I don't know. Did you did you send them or not? I sent them to Maxine. Okay. But only okay. yesterday. So. If, but, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. In the meantime, we'll work with this. We'll see what we can do. All right. So I just put it in the chat for those who are on now, and if anyone joins later, um, yeah, but we're gonna pick up from where we were uh, discussing last week. As I, I, I could share these on the screen as well, if that's helpful. So let me give me one more second. Do -do -do -do. Okay. Actually, that's not really what we're up to. Okay, you know what? Let's let's continue from what we were up to last week, and then I'll I'll put these up when we uh, when we get to this. So last time, oh, <clears throat> as you uh, may recall, we were discussing the version of Esther that we know was published was translated in Yerushalayim in seventy seven BCE. As uh, as we pointed out, that's during the time of the Hashmonaim, and. We reviewed some of the reasons why the Hashmoneim might not have been uh, all that embracing of Esther as we have it. And so maybe not so surprisingly, the version of Esther that comes out of Yerushalayim in 77 BCE, which we have as a Greek version, we'll come back to that in a bit, uh, is different in all sorts of ways. So you recall that it starts <laughs> with the dream, dream of Mordechai, that uh, Mordechai dreamed of two dragons who threatened to destroy the world and then there was a spring of water that came out came a river brought peace to the world and at the end of the book he discovers or realizes that the two dragons were him and haman and the uh, spring of water was esther there's all sorts of interesting details within that uh it doesn't seem in the in the clash of the two dragons it doesn't seem like one is good what is evil um which is interesting. Uh, of course, Mordechai, this is going in a direction that we're not going to pursue, so I'll just raise it. Mordechai is, uh, in a sense, responsible for the whole story of, uh, of the Megillah uh, by not bowing down to Haman. It's never entirely clear why he doesn't bow down to Haman. And one wonders whether he felt bad at some point for not bowing down to Haman. Could have prevented a lot of trouble. Um, in any event, in the in the dream that he reports, he and Haman are two dragons, but it's not the case that there is one dragon that's trying to destroy the world and he represents the forces of good protecting the world. It actually does portray them as two violent, dangerous creatures, and the clash between them is what threatens to destroy the world until Esther steps in between and, um, and uh, brings peace to the world. So all there's a lot of... of uh, of details to work through in terms of the dream. But as we discussed at the end of uh, our class last week, the most obvious and I think most important part here is just the fact that there is a dream because that immediately does two things. First of all, it makes Mordechai into a uh, Daniel Yosef-like figure where I have dreams, they know how to interpret dreams. Uh, and so Mordechai is immediately made into a uh, more obviously religious leader than he is in the text, the Hebrew text as we have it, where we actually don't know that uh, Hashem is on his side at all. No one ever says that, of course, since Hashem is not, not mentioned. 
Uh, and second of all, also makes it clear that the whole, pl the whole plot of the story of Esther is in fact designed, orchestrated by God. So since it was in a dream from the beginning, uh, we know that this is God standing behind it. And so we get two things at the same time. We get on the one hand, the sense that this is divinely orchestrated and it's before it started. And on the other hand, the fact that Mordechai is uh, an Ish Elohim, uh, someone who, who gets divine revelation, understands divine revelation. And so that's, uh, that's accomplished right at the beginning of the, this new and improved version of Esther uh, with Mordechai's dream at the beginning. Now, I will put up, I'm gonna share, this is, we're still on the sources from last week. So I'm gonna share on the screen now, the, those sources, if you have them, and that's great. If not, uh, it's no problem, you can read along here. So I think I mentioned last week that there are six additions to the book of Esther in the Greek version. So they are conventionally labeled A through F, just in order. So A and F are what we looked at very briefly last week. A being the dream, and F being the, the interpretation of the dream. B and E, they sort of come in pairs. B and E are the text. We're not going to look at them because they're the text of the letter that Haman sent out to the provinces uh, licensing the genocide of the Jews. And then at the end, E, the text of the letter sent out by Mordechai and Esther, allowing the Jews to uh, fight back and defend themselves. So instead of just saying, as we have in the Megillah, in the Hebrew Megillah, uh, Mordechai and Esther sent out a letter and said, in the Greek version, we get a whole 20 verse uh, letter, like the copy of this. This is what it says from the king and so on and so forth. So we're not going to look at those. They're interesting, but they're, they're, not, uh, they're not central to our, our discussion. But C and D in the middle are incredibly important, incredibly central to uh, thinking about how people read and responded to the book of Esther uh, in ancient times. So they are set in between what we have is Paragdalet and Parakeh. So as you recall, Paragdalet is the discussion, the dialogue between Mordechai and Esther, uh, where Mordechai is trying to get Esther to do something. Esther says no. Esther eventually says she will do something, but it's not what Mordechai said to do. And in fact, by the end of the Parak, Esther is telling Mordechai what to do. Right? And Mordechai goes out um, uh, and does all that Esther commanded him. At that, and then Parakeh, as we have it, is Esther going to the king. In between, we get two long additions. So first, I just gave you an excerpt from edition C, which you see here. Then Mordechai prayed to the Lord, calling to remembrance all the works of the Lord. And he said, oh, Lord, Lord, you rule as king over all things. I, I don't even have to read more <laughs> because the most important point is already made. You have Mordechai davening to Hashem in Megillah, uh, in the Greek version. So Hashem's actually mentioned a number of times in the Greek version, uh, even in parts that are not additional. Uh, God's name is invoked in the Greek version. But certainly one of the potentially disturbing things about Megillah Esther is that, in fact, there's no religious activity whatsoever. Even at the most obvious part, where there has to be religious activity, when Esther says to Mordechai, go, knoset kol yodim, Metsumu alai shloshet yamim, fast for me. Well, what do you mean tsumu? You look quickly at, uh, at fasts, at latsum in Tanakh, and it's virtually always accompanied by another activity. People are always tsam and za'ak el Hashem, or kara el Hashem, or vayit palel el Hashem. You fast and pray. You don't just fast. But here, just tsumu alai shloshet yamim, just fast. And it's true that they're gathering, but there's no explicit mention of prayer at all. And this is certainly uh, surprising, I think, for anyone who's reading it. Like, oh, what are they doing when they're fasting? They're, they're fasting and then getting together and what? Just talking about how hungry they are? Like, do something with this fasting. So that is rectified in the Greek version. Mordecai goes out and prays. So this, of course, is a sort of obvious correction to a, I think, perceived flaw in the Megillah. And then the Megillah neglects to tell us that there was prayer. Along come these translators, and they're like, okay, let's just put in the prayer. In fact, here's the prayer. So that's, that's one correction. But then we turn to Esther. And then Queen Esther, seized with deadly anxiety, fled to the Lord. So she's also going to be a lot more re overtly religious 
than we have in the Hebrew text. She took off her splendid apparel and put on the garments of distress and mourning. And instead of costly perfume, she covered her head with ashes and dung. And she utterly humbled her body. Every part that she loved to adorn, she covered with her tangled hair. She prayed to the Lord God of Israel and said, oh, my Lord, you only are our, are our king. Which, of course, is striking because she's literally married to the person who is actually the king. No, no, he's not a real king. Only you are our king. Help me, who am alone and have no helper but you, for my danger is in my hand. And then she gives a little bit of a, of a recap of some version of Jewish history that you're welcome to read later on. And then asks God to help her with what she needs to do. She needs to go to the king. God, put eloquent speech in my mouth before the lion. Turn his heart to hate the man who is fighting against us so that there may be an end of him and those who agree with him. Save us. Now, here comes, I think, the most interesting part, starting in verse 15 here. You have knowledge of all things. You know that I hate the splendor of the wicked and abhor the bed of the uncircumcised and of any alien. You know my, my necessity, that I abhor the sign of my proud position, which is upon my head on days when I appear in public. I abhor it like a filthy rag. I don't wear it on the days when I'm at leisure. Your servant has not eaten at Haman's table. I've not honored the king's feast or drunk the wine of libations. Your servant has had no joy since the day that I was brought here until now, except in you, O Lord God of Abraham. O oh God, whose might is over all, hear the voice of the despairing. Save us from the hands of evildoers and save me from my fear. So this is exactly what we commented on a couple of weeks ago is missing anywhere in the Megillah is a sign that Esther actually is contrite, is aware of the sacrifices she's making. It says, look, I have to, but you know, I feel terrible about it. Or I'm trying to find ways of, of uh, threading the needle here. I need to be here, but... You know, here's what I'm willing to sacrifice on. Here's what I'm not willing to sacrifice on. And of course, in the Megillah, there's nothing like that. Even after Ahasuerus knows that she's a Jew later on, she never says anything about, uh, about the food or Shabbat or anything of the sort. But here, in the Greek version, she does. And she says, look, I know I need to be here. We get that. But you, God, you know how I feel about this. I have to be sleeping with the king, but I hate sleeping with the king. I have to wear a crown on my head, but I hate the crown on my head. I abhor it like a filthy rag. I don't wear it when I don't have to. I don't eat the food that I don't have to eat. I don't show up at the feast. I don't drink the wine. I don't go to Haman's table. I don't know. I don't, I think now me, I, I don't understand the reference to Haman's table. It's not clear to me if there's something special about Haman's table that would have been particularly problematic or if she's just using it as an example. Um, but generally speaking, she says, I am miserable here. Right? Yes, I have to be the queen of Persia because I understand, like Mordechai says, uh, like I get it, maybe there's some plan here, but I hate every minute of this existence because of the sacrifices that's making me make in my religious life. So this is incredibly overt correction to the flaws in the Hebrew text, right? You read the Hebrew text, you're like, well, Esther, I don't know. I mean, I, I like what she does in the end, but not only is she intermarried, she doesn't even seem to be, feel bad about being intermarried. Like, I, I don't really see how we can hold her up as a hero. So along comes this addition and says, I'll tell you how. That's, you have to get into her head. She is absolutely racked with anxiety and grief over the life that she's living. She is no less aware uh, than any reader of how terrible it is what she's doing, but she feels that she needs to do it. So this, so this uh, fixes, it corrects, it improves the character of Esther from a religious perspective. Now, the next part is a lot less um, tendentious ideologically, but it's important for some other reasons. So on the third day, she finishes praying, moves her morning clothes, put on her royal robes. So that's a nice uh, interpretation of Vatil Basha Star Malchut, right? So why does she have to put on Malchut? Well, she had just spent three days in mourning. And she appears in the court, took along her two female servants, uh, and she was blushing in the full bloom of her beauty. Her face was delightfully cheerful, but her heart was tense with fear. And then, most importantly, the king looks up. He lifted his face, which blazed gloriously, about to explode in anger, because she violated the rules, and the queen collapsed. Her color turned pale. She fell face forward onto the female servant who was walking ahead of her. And God changes the king's spirit, 
you see here the tenderness and he uh, supports her and awakes her and then the story picks up with what's familiar to us from the uh, from the Hebrew. Uh, now that part is um, uh, I, I think less obviously ideological and it doesn't change the character of Esther in a, in a clearly religious way. And yet it does change the character of Esther, at least opens possibilities of interpreting the character of Esther. Because why is Esther suddenly fainting there? What's, what does that say about her? The, the sort of surface level, which may be right, is, uh, is that she's simply overcome with fear. She's terrified. Here you have the king, who is it, admittedly her husband, but also the most powerful man in the world, who is looking at her in rage. She knows she's violating the law and she simply collapses. She can't, can't stand uh, in, that, uh, in that tense moment um, to, uh, to stand with any, any strength. Artists have loved this scene. So I'm gonna actually put up some, uh, put up some images here. I'll just share them on the screen. And artists, I'm just gonna show you some, a selection of artists from medieval <clears throat> Europe who paint the scene of Esther collapsing in front of the king. This is actually not a painting, but uh, this one is in the Metropolitan Museum and engraving in the early 15th century. But I wanna get to some of the more dramatic ones. This is Tintoretto in 16th century Venice. We have Esther totally collapsed on the floor. You see the, the ladies who she's accompanied by. And you see Achashverosh who is moved to get up from his chair and come approach her. You also see the man behind Achashverosh, almost holding his hand or just behind his hand, who may reasonably, given the colors and his position, be thought to be Haman. And you wonder whether Tintoretto is, uh, put him there. Remember that in Esther's prayer in the Greek version, Esther said, you know, I've never eaten at Haman's table. Haman's always been her, her nemesis. And now she walks in and she sees Haman before, behind the king. Does that add to the drama? I'll, I will not over-interpret these right now. I think they're uh, really stunning and evocative. There's a lot, uh, a lot I want to just leave for you to contemplate. Uh, another engraving from the 17th century in Italy. Um, Veronese, back to Venice in the 16th century. Here, she's fainting, but not nearly as dramatically. Uh, I actually want to skip to my favorite one, which is in the Metropolitan Museum uh, by Artemisia Gentileschi, who is, uh, you know, both the uh, best known female uh, painter of the, <coughs> of the Renaissance, uh, but also just one of the best painters of the Renaissance. This is also in the Metropolitan Museum. It's huge. It's, uh, I think, about nine feet wide and seven feet, seven feet tall, uh, and it's very dramatic. And very different from Tintoretto, for example, in that she's, she keeps the characters here to a bare minimum. There's no one here but the two ladies in waiting, Esther, who's fainting, and the king, <coughs> sorry, all of whom, of course, are dressed in lovely European clothes. Uh, the king looks remarkably young. But, um, but the, the, the sparseness of the characters here uh, certainly adds, I think, to the drama. I think Gentileschi understood that. This is not a... Uh, a rich court scene with lots of people mulling around, doing each one doing their own thing, reacting in their own way. Uh, instead, it's just essentially Esther and the king, and she's accompanied by her two two ladies. Uh, Shira Hechkoler actually has a, a lot more to say about this painting on the artistic front, but uh, that'll be for a different time. Um, Artemisia also... Uh, was really interested in biblical scenes and interested in women in biblical scenes. So I want to put this up now and we'll come back to it. This is a, a very different tone of a painting. This is Artemisia also, but here's Judith beheading Holofernes. I want to contrast the two paintings, but I also want to put this up right now because in a few minutes, we're going to contrast the two stories. So here you have Judith and her maidservant in the book of Judith, which I'll uh, review with you in a bit, in an act of really grotesque violence. Uh, and this is sort of astonishing. It is in the story, but of course, you know, the picture is not in the story. And here you have a picture of a really powerful woman doing something that, uh, of course, the story makes a big deal about this, but one wouldn't expect 
a woman to do, and, and the story is explicit in, in this uh, in this regard. Uh, but Judith has no trouble picking up a big sword and sawing off Holofernes head, which of course she's going to bring back with her. So I put this up now just so I don't have to go back and forth with the images, uh, but also because Artemisia has a whole series. She also paints Bacheva and David. Uh, she paints a whole bunch of uh, biblical scenes and particularly women in biblical scenes in really evocative and dramatic ways. Okay, so all of that, the, the point that I, I wanna make with all of that actually, is that very often uh, Jewish people go to the museum and they see a picture of Edith, uh, oh, Edith, oh my God. as a combination, some weird combination of Esther and Judith. Anyway, uh, Esther uh, swooning before the king, fainting in front of the king, and they're like, well, that's weird. You know, why is everyone in the, in the Renaissance painting Esther painting, painting in, front of the, in front of the king? Like, why, where do they all get this idea from? Uh, and the answer is really straightforward. It's explicitly there in the text. It just depends on which text you're reading. So it's in the Greek text, but the Greek text becomes the Latin text. Jerome translates from the Greek into his Vulgate. And that means that it's the Christian text. And so any Christian, um, down to the Re to the Reformation, and then any Catholic straight through the Reformation, down to modern times, when they read the Book of Esther, actually see that scene. They read the scene of Esther fainting in front of the in front of the king. That's not an addition that the artist made. It's not an interpretation that the artist is imposing on the text. Not that there would be anything wrong with that, uh, but it's actually there in the text itself. Now, I do think that it's really interesting to think about what that scene does to the character of Esther. And I think artists, artists take this in different directions. It could, as I say, uh, sort of characterize her as weak, weaker than we get in the Hebrew at least, where she stands apparently in full regalia and stands there bravely. Uh, maybe this portrays her as weaker than some readers were comfortable with. So you know, a, a proper queen should of course faint when faced with the overwhelming might of her husband. Uh, but certainly some of the artists seem to think uh, I maybe should have dwelled on this with Tintoretto, but uh, some of the artists seem to think that this is another act of manipulation on the part of Esther, that she's not really fainting. She is fake fainting in order to provoke the king's mercy. The king, she has to make sure that the king's on, his, on her side. And if she comes in in any sort of challenging position or assertive position, then who knows how the king will react. But if she comes in and uh, provokes the king to feel compassionate and merciful towards her, then when she says, oh, and, you know, I just came to invite you to a dinner party, I'll be like, of course, of course. Um, so maybe it's another act of, uh, of manipulation on Esther's part. So there's, there's all sorts of possibilities in interpreting the fainting, uh, but the literary history is also, also quite important to just realize that there is uh, this fainting. Now, I said, just said this now as if this was a, a Christian thing. Of course, it's not a Christian thing. And I want to emphasize that the origins of this are explicitly Jewish, meaning this comes, these additions, these, uh, these six additions that we've been talking about are in the Greek version of Esther produced in Yerushalayim in 77 BCE. So first of all, anything BCE is obviously not Christian. <laughs> but second of all, this is Hashmanai Yerushalayim. This is, this is not just like I found a Jew who did this. This is coming out of Yerushalayim controlled by the Hashmanaim. Uh, you know, we talked about the Caliphon in the Greek text last week. It's brought to the Jews in Alexandria it's by, two, uh, by two Jews from Yerushalayim who report that Kohanim in Yerushalayim did this translation. Now, even more, we don't even know if the translators, until now I've said that the translators introduced these changes. We actually don't know that the translators introduced these changes. There is an obvious alternative, and that's that the version that they were translating already had these changes. In other words, I don't know that the, the dream of Mordechai is original to the Greek version. It may well have been that actually there was a Hebrew version of Esther that included the dream of Mordechai and the tefillah of Mordechai and Esther's tefillah in addition D. And then when the translators translated it, they simply translated the version that they had in front of them. I don't know that these things are new in 77 BCE. They may well have predated that. I know that's the version that was translated, but how much is introduced by the Greek translators and how much actually might've been there in an earlier Hebrew version, there's actually no way to know. Scholars have sort of uh, parsed the Greek really carefully to, carefully to find uh, any signs of sort of Hebrew influence in the Greek. And there are some signs of Hebrew influence in part of the Greek, but even that doesn't really prove very much. Uh, bilingual 
trans bilingual translators, I'm sorry, bilingual writers who might have been writing in Greek might also have had influence from Hebrew and the Greek. So there's really no way of knowing the original language of these editions. That's the, the real point I want to make. But the most important point is that these are absolutely emphatically Jewish additions to the text, not Christian editions. It's just that given the, the later history of the text, these became part of the Christian version of the Book of Esther and not part of the Jewish version of the Book of Esther. And that is actually a question we have to come back to hopefully today. Um, if we have this better version of the Book of Esther where everyone's from and talks about God and Davin's, like, why is that not the copy of, the, of Esther that's in Tanakh? Why do we have this problematic one where no one mentions God and no one Davin's and no one, no one, uh, no one keeps, keeps kosher and so on? So that's something that we'll hopefully come back to. But I do want to emphasize that these, this is, it's, it's not wrong to talk about the Jewish version of the Book of Esther and the Christian version of the Book of Esther, but that's only a later reality. Originally, we're talking about two different side-by-side -side versions among the Jews of the Book of Esther, one of which contained all sorts of overt uh, references to uh, religion and ideology, davening, kashras, and so on, and the other one did not. One of them became the Christian version, the other one became the Jewish version, but that's, that's a later development. And on that note, I actually want to show you some of the later developments on the Jewish side here. So interestingly, you open Esther Rabbah, you get things like this. Esther says, oh, what, what Mordechai told Esther was the dream that he once had. What's the dream that he once had? It was like this. Oh, wait a second. I know this dream. I read this dream before. Here it is in Esther Rava. Mordechai repeats this dream about the two great dragons who were fighting, and then there was a spring, and so on. Um, and that's there in Esther Rava. Later on, the next uh, chapter in Esther Rabbah, uh, Esther put on, Esther Rabbah retells the story, the king looked at her, furious. She sees that he's burning mad at her, and she looks. So she faints. She collapses onto the, the woman supporting her on her right side, and then the king takes pity on her. And so on. So like, wait, I, I know all these things. This is straight out of the Greek, ver Greek version, right? That old version. So how does it get from the Greek version into Esther Rava? So it has actually a really fascinating uh, afterlife. So of course it comes from Hashemona Yerushalayim. It's the first time we can pick it up. We don't know, if, you know if it originated there. It goes to Jewish Alexandria. Then of course it goes to the Christian Bible. So that's the part, that's the route that we've already talked about a little bit. But there's another route of transmission. It does go to the Vulgate. Jerome translates into the Vulgate. But then it's not actually only Christians who are reading the Vulgate. One particular person who's reading the Vulgate is a guy in the 10th century in Byzantium who publishes, his name goes, his book goes by the name Yosipon. And Yosipon is a, uh, a historian of sorts, not a, not a original historian but he writes the history of B'nai Israel during Bayat Cheney times. Uh, he was often confused in the Middle Ages with Josephus. So lots of people quote him as Josephus. As they quote him, but they think they're reading Josephus. It's not Josephus, it's a 10th century work. Uh, we know exactly what year actually. Um, but he, um, he, among his sources for how he knows anything about Bayat Cheney Judaism is that he reads the Vulgate. So he has access, he reads Latin, he has access to all these Jewish books that are preserved in the Christian Bible that most Jews are not reading. 
And when he reads Esther in the Vulgate, he's like, hey, this is cool stuff. This is great. This is, uh, you know, there's all these stories here. I'm going to incorporate them in. So in Yosipon, we get the story of Mordechai's dream. We get the story of Esther fainting. And as it turns out, parts of Esther Rabba, the Midrash Esther Rabba, are actually even later than Yosipon. So Esther Rabba is a complicated work, and Midrash in general uh, evolved. The text that we have evolved over many, many centuries of development. And parts of Esther Rabba are actually very, very early, but parts of it are quite late. Uh, this is going to sound weird because you know we think of the periods of Jewish history as they're based on books, but parts of Esther Rabba are later than Rashi. Um, so parts of Esther Rabba are actually based on Yosipon, and through this somewhat circuitous route, these originally Jewish additions to the text, which were relegated to non-canonical status in the Jewish Tanakh, the Jewish version of Esther, and are but are sitting there in the Christian versions of Esther, wind up through Yosipon back into Midrash. So you get the dream and you get the Esther fainting in Jewish literature, but of course not in the book itself, only in the Midrash that accompanies the book. So Jews actually shouldn't be all that surprised when they see the paintings, you know, when they see Tintoretto or Gentileschi painting Esther fainting, they shouldn't say, where did they get this idea from? They should say, wow, that's so weird that Tintoretto was familiar with Esther Rava. Uh, as it turns out, that's not exactly the right diagnosis either, but this is absolutely originally a Jewish story. You know, this is originally a, a Jewish addition to the book of Esther, and it's actually still in Jewish literature, uh, just in the Midrash, of course, not in the, not in the biblical version. Uh, now, I put here just at the top of this uh, handout a few places where we've shown him, quote, Yosipon. I just think this is interesting. Uh, this is really just a question of transmission of ideas. How do, how do things get from one place to another? So Yosipon turns out to be this really important vector. That uh, Yosipon reads some of this earlier literature, especially things that are not in Hebrew Aramaic, they're in Latin and maybe Greek. Um, and, uh, and then he writes in Hebrew. You can read Yosipon also, it's available in your local library or online. Um, and Rashi reads Yosipon, Ibn Ezra reads Yosipon, Ramban reads, they quote him. Uh, that's how they know stuff about Bayacheni history as well. So through Yosipon, actually some unexpected traditions make their way back into medieval Jew Jewish literature, where they haven't been in Jewish literature for a thousand years. Right? So this is like a really interesting example where it's a Jewish story, then it disappears from Jewish tradition for a thousand years, but through the Vulgate and through Yosipon makes its way back into Jewish traditions in the Middle Ages. Okay, so that's, that's really all I'm going to say about the Greek uh, a quote unquote Greek version, uh, the one that's uh, translated and improved. Again, the most important thing that I want to emphasize the history is interesting. I, I think it's fascinating to find out that there was another version of Esther, and that raises its own sorts of questions. But the most important thing I want to emphasize is that the additions here indicate how readers responded to the original version. Because if someone said, Well, I have to add a tefillah here, I have to add a dream here, that means what they read the book, what they were thinking when they read the book was, Something's really missing here. There's no tefillah. There's no dream, right? I got to have that. Uh, the, the, the book is lacking because it doesn't have these key elements. So I'm going to insert those key elements. So the, the additions are really important for cluing us in to what readers thought was absent. And that's the real, uh, the, the real central point that I want to emphasize. Okay. Um, so I'm going to pause here and see if there's a anything that people want to comment or ask. I'll also have to chat for a minute and then we'll pick up with a couple more sources. Mm. Okay, so I see a couple of people ask why these are not in the Megillah itself. Um, hopefully we'll come back to that from a different perspective in a bit. Okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That sort of sounds like we were praying. Um, screaming. I don't know if that's the same. But that uh, word is used for prayer. It is a word that's also that used that is used for prayer. That's certainly true. It's also a word, you know, uh, Aesop uses it when he finds out he's been swindled. Right? I mean, it, it's a word that, that that certainly can be used for prayer. Um, in a public, not as in a private sense. When a lot of people are doing it at one time. So 
I don't want to argue that it is not prayer. I want to argue that it's not explicitly prayer. And there, there are clearer ways of saying pray. I, I think that's, I don't have to uh, say much about that. Uh, and it is, if the author wants to be absolutely explicit, there was prayer, so say that. Say, you know, and then we're good. That like that takes away all the all the questions. So I, I'm not arguing you do that you're that you're wrong to find these hints here and there. Uh, I'm saying that a reader might say, look, why do I have to suffice with hints? <laughs> just just say it. Like, come out and tell me they pray. Like, why, you know, why do I have to argue about this and detect uh, the echoes of the prayer later on in Paraktet? Like, why is it so hard for you, O oh, author of Esther? Just say that they prayed. Um, but again, I uh, not disagreeing with you, just saying that it, it, it could be a lot clearer, and that's really the point. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. So um, Muriel asked whether it's possible that I've been talking about the Greek additions. Is it possible that actually it's the other way around? Maybe the original version of Esther had all this stuff in it, and someone took it out. And, pro and produce the uh, version that's familiar to us without all of this. So I say the, the short answer is that on some level, it's impossible to be 100% sure. There's, we, we don't have uh, evidence in real time to allow us to actually uh, be sure about this. It is clear that the version that we have, that we now have is the Greek version, is secondary. Because for example, even though the very first chapter is the introduction of Mordechai and his dream. The pasuk that's familiar to us from Parag Bet, where we learn Ishi Yehudi Ayavishan Virashmo Mordechai, and so that's still in the Greek version. So, in other words, we're redundantly introduced to Mordechai twice. Uh, we're introduced to Mordechai in the first chapter, and then we're reintroduced to Mordechai, even though we're like we know this guy because have you not remember that you told us two chapters ago that there was a guy named Mordechai had a dream. So that, that's a, a, a sign of secondariness. In other words, that makes sense if someone took the Hebrew version and added before it a preface about the dream and neglected to change the uh, parak bet uh, to take out the introduction of Mordechai. So like, okay, I get how that could happen. It's hard to think of how that could happen the other way around, but even that's not impossible. I, mean, I think it's suggestive, but you, know, you can certainly imagine a more complicated scenario where there are two versions and then eventually this, the later introduction of Mordechai finds its way back into the original version. It's not impossible to uh, that that could be the case. Um, I I don't think it's the case, but certainty is not possible, and to argue it out in a lot of detail would take a lot more time. But uh, it's a, it's absolutely a, a worthwhile possibility to, to put on the table. You also have to ask whether. Well, okay, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, I was up that originally consciously. I must have been there. Right. I think that's that's really a key question that Didi just mentioned. Then. Uh, uh, the question is, um, you know, could we reconstruct this sort of intellectual history? Like, why are people putting it in or, or taking it out? Uh, but yeah, okay, I think that's these are worthy, worthy possibilities that I'm going to not pursue right now. But hopefully, you'll all continue to think about them. Okay, um, so now, sorry, now we're going to switch gears a little bit. I said we'd come to Judith, so let's do that. I hope we have time for one more source, but possibly not. Okay, so let's come to Judith. This is in the sources that uh, were sent out this morning as well. Uh, Judith is a book that, the story is actually familiar to us um, from all sorts of tellings. Whether or not you've ever read the book of Judith, you probably know the story. Uh, it gets told around Hanukkah time, although it's somewhat mysterious whether there's any connection between Judith and Hanukkah. Uh, but the story, is, as you recall, is that there was a, guy, a woman named Judith uh, who lived at a time when Bnei Israel, uh, particularly in her town of Betulia, were um, being oppressed by the general Holofernes, who um, is said to have been the general of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Assyria. And uh, eventually Judith, who is incredibly pious, she's a widow, but she's incredibly pious, uh, also very beautiful, uh, takes her maidservant and they go to the uh, war camp of Holofernes, and I'm, I hope this is not a spoiler. I'm really ruining a, a dramatic story, uh, but they uh, insinuate themselves into uh, um, into the uh, tent of Holofernes, where she spends many days and eventually gains his trust, and then eventually uh, gets him drunk, chops off his head, as you saw in 
in uh, Gentileschi's painting earlier, brings the head back and they put it up on the city gate of Betulia. The uh, uh, enemy sees their general's head on the gate and they all get scared and run away and Judith has thus saved the Jews. Okay, so that was really an unfair, uh, overly short telling of a, of a good story, but for our purposes, it'll have to do. Um, there's lots of indications that this book is fiction. Um, fiction's a loaded term, but first of all, as introduced, I just said, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Assyria, there is no such person, right? Who's Nebuchadnezzar, king of? Babylonia, right? Yeah. Uh, also, there's no town of Betulia. No one's ever heard of this town of Betulia. Also, that's really sort of uh, uh, too coincidentally similar to the Hebrew word Betula, which seems to sort of uh, encapsulate Judith's role here, not as a virgin exactly, but as a uh, marriageable, beautiful woman who's going to seduce uh, Holofernes. She doesn't, of course. She's very, very pious, but she is. Uh, he thinks that she that she would. Um, and then she kills. <clears throat> then she kills the uh, the enemy general. Uh, when is this book written? It's a good question. It's a really good question. Uh, the scholarly consensus today is that it's written during the times of the Hashmonaim. All sorts of indications of that from within the book, about the geography, about the language, different indications. I'm not going to worry about it right now. But within the times of the Hashmonaim. So let's just say our round date, 100, 100 BCE or so, uh, for the story of Judith. Now, the story of Judith is, again, uh, an interesting story because it's familiar to Jews, but it's in the Christ it's in the Christian and then the Catholic Bible. It's part of what we call the Apocrypha. It's there. It's a Jewish book that's preserved in the version of Tanakh that becomes the Christian Bible, not the Jewish Bible. Why is it not in the Jewish Bible? Good question. People have had all sorts of uh, different hypotheses ranging from Maybe it's just too late. Maybe Tanakh was closed already by the time this book was written in 100 BCE. Uh, to maybe the, it bothered people that uh, she uses a sword. Uh, the Targum translates Lotobash Gever Clay Isha, Lotobash Isha Azaga, Simlatish. I could just make up a Pasuk, something like that. Uh, no, Clay Gever, Lo something. Ah, whatever, you got the idea. Uh, and Devarnam says that a, a man should not wear uh, the, the garment of a woman, and a woman should not have on a clay, clay gever. Uh, the Targum says a woman should not use a sword. Uh, so that's another possibility. Maybe there was, it was seen as halakhically problematic, even though she saved the people, that she wielded a sword. So all sorts of possibilities as to why the book may not have made it into Tanakh. Into Tanakh. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not so worried about it right now. Um, but... Again, like the Greek version of Esther, this absolutely remains a story known to Jews. So Jews know the story of Judith. It becomes associated with Hanukkah somehow. Uh, also, like in sort of weird, vague ways, people associate it with Shavuos and something about Milchik stuff. There's all sorts of like interesting connections that have developed over the years between this story and various Jewish holidays that are really more fascinating than important for our topic. But here's what is important for our topic. Some people have suggested that the book was written in part as a reaction to Esther. Now, there are some ways in which the book clearly draws on earlier parts of Tanakh. So clearly Judith is modeled to some extent on the figure of Yael, who kills Sisera. That's like so entirely obvious that that's one model that the author has uh, in mind as he's writing the story of Judith. But also, there's a lot of ways in which the story of Judith uh, echoes uh, the story of Esther. So we have, of course, uh, the basic point that you have a woman who is uh, using her sexuality to infiltrate the literally the bedroom uh, of the person in charge of the enemy, or the, the person in charge of the, the, the threat to the Jewish people and using that uh, power, that influence, to then turn around and save the Jewish people. That's the, the most obvious and most important point of connection here. But of course, Judith is, is in, a, in a way, uh, a much more kosher version of Esther in that way. First of all, she never sleeps with Holofernes. It's said over and over. I gave you a whole excerpts from Judith on the handout. So you can read the whole book. I certainly would encourage it. But, um, but not only does she 
pray often, but we repeatedly hear she brings her own food. Halaferni says, here, I have food. She says, no, no, I only drink kosher wine. I only eat kosher food. I have my own food. She, of course, doesn't come in physical or sexual contact with him. Uh, she's very careful about her own uh, propriety. She's very wise. Um, and all of this is, can be seen, and, and some, sometimes has been seen, as a corrective to the portrait of Esther. So in other words, you can imagine someone saying, look, I love the idea of a story where we're threatened by a genocidal enemy and we're saved by a, a wise woman who manages to uh, get into the halls of power and use that position to then save the Jews. That's a great story. But Esther is flawed in so many ways. I mean, you can do that without actually sleeping with the king. You can do that without giving up on Shabbat and Kashrut. Like, why do you have to do all that? So here's a story where you have the same basic idea of the woman saving the Jewish people, but without all the problematics that Esther raises. So she davens all the time. She makes sure to, uh, to keep all of the mitzvot. Um, you see, Halifernes, you know, it would be a disgrace if we let such a woman go without having intercourse with her. If we don't seduce us, she will laugh at us. And they totally don't understand because she, of course, is going to laugh at them, but in a very, uh, very different way. Uh, and the, the, the possibility is that Judith is a rewriting of Esther. Again, not, this is not, uh, this is not the all-encompassing theory of Judith. Judith is, as I said, drawing on a lot of different sources, doing a lot of different things. But one thing it might be doing is reacting to the book of Esther and saying, look, I'm going to take your basic plot outline, but give you a better version of it. In other words, this would be what would happen if a Hashmonai wrote the story of Esther. So Esther is not going to just sleep with the king and thereby manipulate him. She's going to, first of all, not sleep with the king. And second of all, do what any good Hasmonean would do, pick up a sword and chop the guy's head off. Because that's what Hashmonean do, right? When they're faced with enemies, they don't manipulate their way. They don't hope that they're going to be in the right place at the right time and uh, get behind Haman's back and you know, trick them into uh, a party where she can hopefully manipulate everyone's emotions. That's not what Hashmonean do. Hashmonean pick up their swords and they fight. And there's, of course, a risk in that, and, which is that you might die. And the Hashmonim's perspective is, you might die. And you know what? They all do die. But that's worthwhile to save the Jewish people. Certainly better, they might say, than Esther, who doesn't seem willing to give up on, an, on anything of her own life. She's not willing to sacrifice. She's not willing to fight. She's going to give up on Shabbat, give up on Kashrut, give up on, on, uh, on her own sexuality, her sexual propriety, uh, everything. She gives up on everything just for the sake of saving the Jews. And this is unacceptable. You want a good Jewish heroine, Judith is a good Jewish heroine. This does the same as Esther, but in a much better way. So I don't know that this is correct. Uh, I don't know that it was intentionally written as a response to Esther. A weaker version of this would be that even if it wasn't written as a response to Esther, it could have been read as a response to Esther. In other words, uh, that people might have said, look, I know two stories about Jewish women who saved their people uh, from a genocidal threat. I know the story of Esther, I know the story of Judith. I certainly prefer, prefer the story of Judith. This woman doesn't give up on uh, all of our <laughs> values in order to do what she needs to do. Alla Milos. Exactly, exactly. So Judith is is far superior in that way uh, than Esther. So I think it's tempting to think uh, that in fact, the author was intentionally rewriting Esther uh, and improving it. But a weaker version would be, even if it, that wasn't the intention, and again, we don't really know who, when, what the book was written. Uh, it's only a surmise uh, to, that it's a Hashmonai book, uh, that people in Hashmonai Yerushalayim or elsewhere, uh, doesn't have to be in Yerushalayim in particular, would have preferred the story of Judith and would have seen a contrast between the characters of Judith and the character of Esther. And again, the point here is to highlight the problematics of Esther. That's really what I wanna, what I wanna highlight. So at this early stage, and the stage where we're talking about Greek Esther, and we're talking about um, Judith, we can still talk about a text that clearly some people think can still be either overwritten uh, or actually changed. In other words, it's not what we would call a canonical text, right? One of the things that is, of course, really interesting uh, about the, the difference between, let's say, the Greek version of the dream and the Esther Rabbah version of the dream is that Esther Rabbah is explicitly not in the text. By putting it in Esther Rabbah, it's in a different book. 
right? It accompanies the book, but it's not part of the text itself. That's what you do once you have a canonical text. So if I have a canonical text already, I can't touch it, right? I can't, I can't change the book of Esther anymore. It's a biblical book. Obviously it is what it is. All I can do now is interpret it. I can add next to it. I can say here, when you read this, think about that. When it says this, I can ask what Yehudi said. Uh, I can look, I can say, oh, you, you wonder if they didn't pray? No, no, look later on, it says Akatam. See, they did pray. Um, so I can interpret it in that way. But early on, and I think this is important to remember, and this, you know, we'll see next week that um, this is almost explicit in Chazal. Early on, it's not a biblical book. People still thought it was malleable, right? So I get the book, and maybe I think, no, nah, I don't like this book. This book's not going into, into Tanakh. There's no way. Maybe I think, hmm, it's a good book. I like the book. You know, important events, uh, good lessons, but needs to be improved a little bit, right? So good book, but needs some, need some more prayer, right? You can imagine an editor's uh, comment on the, uh, on the front page, like, like, good start, but you need to have some more prayers in here. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to add in addition C and addition A. Like, I'll, I'll put it in there to make sure it's better. Um, but all of this indicates that for a number of centuries, the book was seen as not set, as not canonical in the sense that, uh, that we, of course, take it today and that other books were in those days. Obviously, no one was tampering with Breshit or Sefer Shmuel in the year 200 BCE. Those books were already set. Um, there's a... It's, a, it's an interesting discussion because we have a lot of evidence from uh, Qumran about how they were and were not treating those texts. But in any event, they were not, um, they were not tampering with it. Uh, they could rewrite it, they could interpret it, but they weren't saying, you know what, Shmuel is good, but here's the new edition. But Esther, maybe it was new enough, uh, maybe it was different enough that people were still changing it. People still felt free to actually editorialize about, about this book. And the last point I'll make here, because um, it is sort of filling out the, the picture here, is that we, I think we know about at least some Jews who in fact said, this book's just not salvageable. The, the book's just not good. It's, it can't be part of our collection at all. And the Jews that seem to have taken that tack were the Jews who lived at Qumran, the group of, uh, that gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls. Again, like most things in ancient history, it's hard to be absolutely certain about anything, but at least little parts of every single book of Tanakh have been found at Qumran, except for Esther. There is no, uh, no material trace of the book of Esther at Qumran, not a fragment, not a, not a little, uh, no, not three words, not anything. Um, now, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you've seen them, uh, some of them are really beautiful, you know, the ones in the Hechala Sefer in Yerushalayim look like real books. The vast majority of them look like burnt cornflakes. Um, so, of course, it's, it's obviously possible that it's just a coincidence. Like maybe there was the Book of Esther, but we happen not to have it. You know, lots has been lost from Qumran. But so much of what we've said about Esther would have offended the people of Qumran that I think it's absolutely plausible that, in fact, the people of Qumran looked at this book and were just like, this is a terrible book. There's no way that we're copying this book and keeping it in our library at Qumran. We have to remember just a little bit about the people of Qumran. And, and uh, of course, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls are a huge topic worth lots more time. But first of all, Qumran is not a normal place to live. Right? This is a weird settlement on the shores of the Dead Sea where less than a thousand only men uh, moved to live in communion with their you know, scribal habits and each other and communal meals and all sorts of uh, interesting, really fascinating, but obviously bizarre <laughs> things in uh, Bayacheni Judaism. Like, these are not uh, your run-of-the-mill Jews in, uh, in Bayacheni times. They absolutely resist everything about assimilation and acculturation. Uh, they don't like even the Hebrew that are spoken by Jews in Yerushalayim, which is too colloquial. Uh, they spend their day studying Tanakh, copying Tanakh, interpreting Tanakh, expecting the uh, end of days to come any minute now uh, for God's uh, revelation to spread over the world. Uh, they're, they're not going to be in favor of a book that essentially says it's all, or at least can be read to say, uh, it's all good to be a good Persian queen as long as you survive in the end. It's like so vastly different from their worldview 
And I think it's entirely plausible that it's not a coincidence that we don't have Esther from Qumran. But they looked at the book, they read the book, and they were like, not for us. I don't know what Jews think this is a good book, but we certainly do not think this is a good book. And I, I'm going to use that just to summarize now is that we have, I think, uh, you know, this is all, um, none of this is, is with absolute certainty, but I think it's likely that we have some Jews in Bayat Sheni who read the book of Esther and simply dismiss it, like, you know, this is a bad book. Some Jews who say, hmm, good idea, but needs to be rewritten. Like, I like the, I like the basic plot. Here's a book of Judith. That's a better version of, of a similar story. Some Jews who say, okay, like we're going to keep the book of Esther, but it's got to be um, for Teich and for Bessert, as, uh, as we mentioned last week, right? So uh, it's going to be a Jewish book, but we need some more tefillot, we need some more kashrut, we need some more Shabbat, we need some more frumkite in here. I mean, we need God. <laughs> like, how about, you, know, you can't be a good Jewish book without God. Uh, and then some Jews who we haven't talked about, but some Jews who obviously preserved the book as it was. This, again, I don't have direct evidence for, except that it's obvious because we have the book. So someone, some groups of Jews were in fact copying the book, preserving the book, and, and uh, uh, at some point, uh, to use a loaded term, canonizing the book, including it as Kitvea Kodesh, as we know it. In other words, with all the problems that we've talked about, there were obviously some Jews, some groups of Jews who were like, no, that's fine. Now, why did they think it was fine? That's hard to know. In other words, they think it was fine because, of course, Esther and Mordechai were from, you know, uh, of course they were davening, it doesn't say so. Do they think it was it was okay because they liked these problematics? Uh, Do they think it was okay because they were subversive and didn't believe in some of these things? I have no idea. We, we'll never know why they didn't do anything to the book. Um, but uh, but clearly there are some who were, um, uh, who preserved the book as well. So we have sort of a map of at least I mean, this is a fairly artificial way of dividing up responses, but I just sketched out four different responses to the book of Esther. Keep it as it is, keep it but improve it, rewrite it as a different story entirely, or just ignore it, reject it. Uh, those are four different ways that people in Bayat Sheni seem to have responded to the book of Esther. And again, the most important thing that I, I want to emphasize is not so much this map of, of responses as much as what this highlights about the problematics of the book. Because people wouldn't respond this way to most biblical books. In other words, uh, most biblical books you read, you're like, okay, I mean, if, you, you know, if you're a Jewish person, uh, this, is what, this is what we get. Uh, we have God, we have the land of Israel, we have Beit David. But Esther seems to ignore all, so many central values, so many central uh, ideologies of Judaism that it, it certainly challenged readers in a different way than most, uh, than most other books. Okay, so we have a lot more to do, but I'm going to pause for pause here. Let me just see what's in the in the chat, and then um, we'll have to wrap up. Zaka, right, Sandra? That's a great point. I was thinking the same thing. At the end of Parak Bet and Shmot, when Bnei Israel are Yizaku, and God hears, uh, mm -hmm. it's hard to say whether that's prayer or not. They call right. out. Yeah, right. really it could be that God hears it as a plea, but right. that that. Why, how it was intended by them. Mm -hmm. That's how I sort of interpreted it. And, that, and you've actually made it clearer to me now with this zaka that Yudi pointed out. Um, this zaka may have been simply a zaka. You said it may have been a prayer, but it wasn't explicitly a prayer. Yeah. And it's also right. reread it, right. Shava. Mm -hmm. So zaka mm -hmm. turns into Shava. Mm -hmm. And so it sure sounds like it's being looked upon as prayer. Right, right. Rav Soloveitchik once in a in a in a shear that that I I heard in a tape, um, he deals with the notion of zaka and he says that zaka is a gut plea. It always is. Mm. So I would go with Yudi here because uh, if the, I, I I mean it's a whole lecture's worth of talking about it. But he says that a zaka is from the guts. It's a scraping of the guts. So it's an it's a prayer, ab initio. It's a prayer. Nice, very nice. Um, uh, so iPad has a really nice comment here that I'll, I'll just pick up on. Um, there's a lot of a few other comments here that I won't have time to, but I, I think it's absolutely tempting to think that there's a difference here between how Jews in Eretz Israel may have read Esther and Jews outside of Eretz Israel may have read Esther. Jews who are in Persia, who are actually struggling with these questions all the time, uh, may have said, "Look, that's our life, right? I mean, this is this is what we have. We uh, we can't walk around fighting with our enemies all the time because if we do." Uh, we will die. I mean, we, we can't beat the Persian Empire in Shushan Abira. 
Uh, whereas Jews in Hashmonai Eretz Israel may have said, hey, but that's exactly what we did, right? I mean, that's what, that's what we do. Uh, we have our own, our own country. I think that's really useful. And we're going to come back to that from a different perspective uh, in probably a couple of weeks when we think about the same question in modern times. I think it's empirically the case that Jews in Eretz Israel today tend to read Esther in different ways than Jews in uh, outside of Eretz Israel today. And I think some of those same issues are in play. So that's a, it's a great point. Lynn, you're going to get the last uh, comment. Uh, uh, Rabbi, with Tsa'aka, though, when in the original in Shemot, it says that the children of Israel cried out and God he heard them. Right. But when Moses retells it in Dvarim, he says explicitly, and they cr you cried out to God. But he doesn't say you pray. So he adds information, but he doesn't as to who they're crying out to. But it isn't in the original, but he doesn't say that they were praying. Sorry, I understand. <laughs> All right, Lynn, last comment. A couple of comments. Um, first of all, I think we need to put Esther into the context of the end of Dvarim when God says, Haster, Aster, Panai, and all of a sudden you have a heroine here whose name is Esther. This oh, is the reality wonderful. of being in exile. And Judith is not an exilic text. It takes place in the land of Israel. So of course the, the thrust, uh, excuse the pun, is different. Uh, I, I, and you need to set up that, 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 that knowledge of disparity between Jews in exile, Haster, Astir, Panai, and your heroine's name is Esther, and Judith, who is in the land, is, is in Judah, okay? Um, and right. uh, yeah. another comment with Artemisia Gentileschi, she was raped by her teacher and patron. And so her... her, uh, it was her, her father's student raped her. Yeah, so um, her portrayal of the, the slaying of Holofernes is in a way an expression of getting back at what happened to her. Yeah, Jim is actually astonishing, but um, yeah, I'll we'll have to leave that there. Okay, uh, your Hester, Hester, and I, we will, you will be happy to know we will talk more about next week and hopefully we'll have a lot more time to talk you. more next week. Thank you. Actually, <laughs> we can, if you, if we wait uh, 27 minutes, Rachel Shransky Danzig will be talking, and her topic is the ins and outs of liberty. And today's topic is the template of redemption. And I think uh, some of the issues that you were addressing, I don't know if you're going to address them exactly, but uh, going back, you know, comparing how uh, the Gula and Frank and B'nai show. So that's uh, Rachel Shransky. Danziger at 27 minutes from now at 11 a.m. And you can say, wait, we won't turn off the uh, chat. You can turn off your video and mute and get a cup of, of coffee, go for a walk. It's not raining yet. So it's supposed to rain soon. Um, but um, we'll keep the chat, we'll keep the, the, the Zoom channel on. And then at 1 p.m., Rabbi Alex Israel will be continuing a series on Eliyahu, the prophet of fire. And then uh, tomorrow, Menachem Kellner, I think we announced that he was originally supposed to have his last series tomorrow, but he can't make it. He has to teach at Shem, whatever he, so he will not be teaching tomorrow at 11, but at 2 p.m., Mark Shapiro will be talking to Chaim Ishkashish. If anybody was on, I don't know if anybody here was on a trip to Greece, he, Chaim is the uh, local tour guide, one of the few remaining Jews, Romanite Jews in the world, the original Greek Minhagim, which he is the expert. He has one of the, owns one of the, I think there are only three shofar left in the world, the special, you know, shofar. I imagine he'll blow it tomorrow. I don't know, but knowing Chaim, and he's quite a fascinating fellow. And uh, so that's tomorrow at uh um, I, I apologize. Thank you, Mel, if I mispronounced it. Um, I, that's tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, Mark, Dr. Mark Shapiro will be interviewing him. Please, God, we'll be having our trip starting this summer, although we're not planning a Greece trip, but uh, our Portugal trip and our Centro trip are actually up. If you want to register for them, please, God, after three years, we can get back to visiting places around the world. And then tomorrow night, of course, Dr. Sokolo will be giving his, uh, continuing his series on the putting together of Tanakh. And then Thursday, Shuli Mishkin and uh, at 12 noon, Biblical Archaeology, Parsha tomorrow night, and Maishir and Sitter at uh, 9 a.m. Friday morning. Okay, we'll look forward to learning with you. Please invite a friend. That's always a place of admission is please invite a friend to join us to learn. And Dr. Coley, we look forward to learning with you next week. Lots of stuff, how to read Esther. And I will say, I just got your book this week. 
Um, so I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I did pick up your book on Esther this week. So uh, thank you very much uh, for even for that inspiration. Okay. All right, everybody, be well. Uh, I'll see you in 25 minutes. Bye-bye.